Hello and welcome to another episode of DIY EV Chat, where I speak to other people who've been nuts enough to build their own EVs. Uh, not just once, but many times in this case, um, because I have as my guest today, Paul Compton. Hello, Paul. Hello, Tom. Now, you've been doing this an awful lot longer than I have. Um, I'm not even sure where to start, but my standard first question is, what was your day job or what is your day job? Because people always ask me what skills you need to do this sort of stuff. And people assume that it's people who are professional engineers or have done something in that vein. Uh, what did you or do you do? Um, well, I have, as of now, escaped the world of work. Um, but I was for 32 years uh, an electronics engineer at Rothenstead Research in Harpenden. Oh, wow. And, uh, but I got in basically unqualified. Right, okay. So you so, sort of qualified on experience? Well, I've been doing electronics since I was about seven or eight or something. And um, although, you know, I, I didn't do very well academically, basically because I'm too lazy to do any of the work. But I understood enough of the subjects to get, you know, mediocre O levels um, and I, I did a year at what was then de Havilland um, um, in um, Welling. Okay, yeah. Um, and on a combined mechanical and electronic engineering BTEC ONC during which I was mostly bored out of my skull. Uh, because I was probably four years ahead of the lecturers in electronics, because uh, they were physics lecturers, they weren't electronic specialists, they were just working from a, a, a textbook. Sure, so they understood the theory maybe, but you had an awful lot more practical experience. Yeah, and then on the, uh, the engineering side, I'd actually, at my school, been allowed to, you know, use a lathe and that sort of thing which meant I was probably four years ahead of anyone else on my course. So, yeah, you end up being bored a lot of the time and I really wasn't doing well. And then I was just incredibly fortunate to find that they wanted an electronics person to work at Rothamsted at was then the lowly TG2, the technical grade two entry grade. Um, and yeah, just kind of slotted in there doing all the, well, I mean, there were, I think, seven PCs on site, <laughs> uh, which were the PCG. If people have come across an IBM XT, that was the extended version. Um, and mostly it was terminals and VAX 11750s, uh, big cabinets that shook backwards and forwards as the, the head, dry, head motors um, uh, went backwards and forwards. And I, I would look after the, the terminals because with great big long lines skating across site, they would, every time a big black cloud came over, you were going out and replacing line drivers and things. And, um, and we were also designing custom electronics for scientists and repairing scientific equipment. And yeah, I, I stuck it out until they decided that they couldn't afford uh, me or a bunch of other people. And I left on a big voluntary redundancy payout. And um, also in that same year, I had a fairly serious motorcycle accident. Um, something I had no right to walk away from. Um, and I didn't. I went into hospital on a spinal board, but I'd walk out of it uh, three hours later. Um, and I'm still feeling the, the, the effects. But um, my mother lives with me. She's just turned 91. Wow. And I am basically chief cook and bottle washer. And that's what I, I do these days. And uh, Apart from an incredible range of EV projects and car projects. Um, <laughs> history with this. This whole story started down the pub, as so many good stories do. <laughs> um, my longest standing friend Mark and I used to drink at a rural pub where some of my work colleagues had a shared house. 
And so we were reasonably well known to the locals and they knew that we were into classic cars. And one evening, um, someone came up and said, you guys are into classic cars. One of the local girls has, girls has rolled her Triumph Herald on the way home from the pub. Um, would you like the remains of it? And, you know, we were building Triumph-based kit cars at the time. So, yeah, go on. So we, some parts had already been, been scavenged, but, you know, the chassis suspension bits of bodywork were there. Loads now of we had a, based on those. Ab absolutely, and you've seen the pictures of some of them. Yeah, I'll post um, all those in the show notes. There's, there's quite a lot of photos there. Yeah, and um, we had another friend who wheeled and dealed in classic cars a bit, and he had acquired a Sebring Vanguard city car, which uh, I think was once described as the bastard offspring of a wedge of cheese in a telephone kiosk. <laughs> And um, if you're familiar with um, Simone Yetch, no, no, uh, fairly well known YouTuber, used to be known as the Queen of Shitty Robots. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I do know indeed. Yes, I know exactly. What you mean. Well, she has Cheese Louise, which is a yellow Sebring Vanguard city car. Yes, no, I've seen it. I know exactly what you mean. Yes. So this is a car that apparently been brought into the UK uh, for a show, and never went home which was one of the complications was it had never had import tax paid because it was only ever meant to be a temporary import um, and they used like industrial vehicle pressed steel brake drums and all sorts of other bits and pieces they were really quite primitive but actually I think they 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 made a few thousand of them Wow. So it was actually one of the highest selling electric vehicles um, up until present times. And, uh, you know, they did bizarre things like they they weren't really very safe, but they were they were more like a neighborhood electric vehicle. Okay. But they they had people who keep kept seeing to try and shut them down so that every time they complied, they'd think of a new reason why they didn't. But they did at one stage move the batteries from under the seat to a battery box that was the front bumper and was the rear bumper. Because batteries actually make, lead acid batteries actually make quite good crumple zones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it didn't do anything for the handling. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a little bit of trivia that they, um, when they crash conventional cars, they used to put dummy batteries in. Huh. But they discovered they got better crash results if they put in a real battery filled with water. Wow. Because it's got that little bit of extra absorbency in it. Yeah. But yes, this thing, thing had batteries, you know, hung on the front, hung on the back, you know, leaf sprung. Um, Electric but, car, know, basically. Yeah, it, it's, but we, you know, we kind of swapped it for the rear end of the Herald that he was then going to turn into a sofa. Um, and tried to get it up and running, but getting parts was obviously a nightmare. Uh, there was still someone in the States who said they could supply stuff, but, you know, it was going to be expensive on shipping and, and so on. And also, we realised that if no VAT had been paid when it was imported, we would most likely have to pay that, not on its current value, but on its original value. Right, OK. So it makes it a bit impractical at that point. Yeah, and I and I believe that by when my friend decided that he could no longer hold on to it... Um, he sold it to a clown. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. So it quite literally became a clown car. <laughs> so that was your first sort of experience of EVs. What was the first one you built? Uh, well, we had we the, there is one between that and the one first one I built. I bought, or rather, I swapped a larder uh, estate for a Hillman Husky, a Hillman Imp Estate. Cool. Um, that had originally been converted by a British university or college. And it had, the front was full of surplus aircraft NICAD cells. Um, Easy to replace then. <laughs> they were at the time fairly readily available as surplus cells. Oh. 
Huh? Um, incredibly long lived, but constantly needing maintenance. Um, the the memory effect with NICAD is pretty much a myth. Only NASA, yeah. Th there's a true memory effect and there's a false memory effect. The true memory effect happens in satellites. And it happens when you discharge a NICAD cell to exactly the same depth of discharge within a few percent. And then try to discharge it deeper than that. And it remembers the depth to which it was discharged. And, you know, you've got the characteristic discharge curve. Yeah, yeah. It goes over the knee at the remembered capacity. Huh. But there is a false memory effect which is caused by overcharging a NICAD cell. So if you overcharge them for more than about 140, 150%, the next time you discharge, that whole curve gets moved down. Hmm. So from about 1.2 nominal to about 0.9. So anything that might have a, a voltage cutoff, like a radio, something like that, or just quit at a certain voltage, well, it appears to have much reduced capacity because when the voltage gets too low, it turns off. But in fact, they've got the same number of amp hours to the knee. Yeah, yeah. And because they've got all these cells in series and they're not matched in capacity, they get overcharged, so you get this problem and then it becomes cumulative and cells get reversed and all that sort of thing. If you look after them, yeah, 20... 30 year old NICAD cells can be, you know, 80% capacity. Wow. You do, do occasion. What? When was it you picked up this Husky? I can't remember the years exactly. It would be early to mid 90s. Okay. Um, it was quite horrendous in places. The adapter plate between the motor and the gearbox was a piece of kitchen countertop. <laughs> and <was> the mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the adapter, the, the coupler was used one of the drive shaft rubber donuts that that Imp used, um, with bits of sawn plate that not even filed edges, and it wasn't bolted to the gearbox. It was held in place with turnbuckles. And the motor, I'm pretty sure, had come from an Enfield. So, um, big Nelco motor, and I found things like the brush plate. All the screws were missing, so the brush plate was floating around, and uh, it didn't didn't have an electronic controller. It had a system called a Rectactor. Wow, I've never even heard of one of those. Well, it's a combination of rectifier and contactor. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And you have four 24 volt blocks, and they are all in parallel for the first stage. So you start off, obviously, main contactor comes on, you're straight to 24 volt. Not smooth. This is this is reminding me of Jamie's uh, electric skateboard from the last episode, where he had a, just an electric skateboard with an on-off switch rather than a speed controller. <laughs> yeah, it, it in combination with the gearbox and the rubber donuts, it kind of was 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 drivable. But yeah, low-speed manoeuvring, particularly reverse, where you get thrown onto the throttle pedal. Uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> Basically, you with, with the way the diodes are configured, if you close a contactor, it then puts two modules in series. So for the second step, you'd close two contactors, so you'd have two modules in series in parallel with two modules in series. You would then go to a step where you had two mod modules in series with two in parallel, and there was a switch that you threw so that it alternated which pair were in series and which pair were in parallel to even out the discharge. Right. And then you go to the full 96 volts for the, for the, the, the full speed. And what speed did you get up to with this contraption? Um, on one occasion, I mean, because it was a 96 volt system and the end field was originally a 48. 
um, and you had the gearbox to use. Um, I think I topped 60 at one point. You're a brave man. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, the, the Imp was a decent decent car in, it, in itself. Um, and the estate um, had this unique feature of it's, it's a hatchback. And you can stand underneath the hatch with it open. And I believe it was actually part of the original advertising was loading the wet in the dry. Nice. Very good. Um, but you had, that, you had the Husky and then there was there one you sort of, what was the first one you sort of built yourself? Well, I sold the imp to an imp collector who only had 14 other imps. <laughs> but he didn't have a Husky. Right. He had the comma. He had the van version of the imp. He had the the, the yeah. comma, but he didn't didn't have it. And this car was in remarkably good condition body wise, even though there was no paint on the front. Well, the NICADs used to leak sodium hydroxide everywhere, and it stripped all the paint off. But it also kept the rust away. <laughs> that's that's an unusual rust treatment. It must have, it must have looked fantastic. Um, and yes, it, it did, did have a nasty habit of misting sodium hydroxide into the air as you drove along. Um, it was very crude and, and yeah, I, I felt I could do something better. And that's why I uh, acquired the Reliant Kitten. The, I've just seen the photo of this thing. It looks fantastic. What, what was you? Know, what was the process? What, what did you? What was that? So you got Reliant Kitten. And they're, they're fiberglass body, I assume, are they? They're a fiberglass body on a steel chassis, um, and actually, one of the problems you get with them is rust in the chassis. Yeah. Um, in particular, the reinforcements that run up the door pillars to mount the seat belts on, they can completely disappear. Uh, mine were fine. Mine had been replaced because you can actually pull pull them out and insert new ones, um, and that was actually quite a good good car. Uh, they they handle really well. The twin wishbone front end with coil springs and uh, leaf rear axle. Wow. Um, they're they're surprisingly good. And I are they, are they front wheel drive? No, no, they're they're, they're rear wheel drive. They're basically Reliant is. More or less Austin Seven running gear, um, you know, ju just adapted and con continued. The, the engine is their own, but based on the Austin engine. But it, you know, it's, it's an all alloy um, engine. Got stretched up to eight fifty cc. Used to be and the backbone of the seven. Well, that's what I. That's what I put the Nelco motor in out of the. Ah, okay. Which was again originally out of an Enfield, I believe, uh, but I put a clutch on it. Okay. Which um, a bit more, uh, bit more control. It gives you more control. It gives you an emergency safety disconnect. It makes it easier to change gear on a gearbox, which is not maybe the best at changing gear. And if you're using a DC motor, reversing the motor is expensive in terms of contactors. Sure. Sure. So selecting reverse gear on the gearbox is really easy. But, of course, the problem is that reverse gear can just go tooth to tooth and not want to go in. And often just pushing the clutch down will let it slip into gear and make, makes it easier. Because otherwise you're, you're sort of turn the motor over slowly and, and then snick it into gear with, without grinding. And it's... Yeah. I just prefer to do it. the clutch. NICADs, was it? Uh, no, I had sold the NICADs to somebody who had a big pile more of them, and I think was using them as solar storage. Okay. Um, and I put in... Well, originally I got a set of used golf car batteries. Um, there was a, uh, a guy up at Toaster Golf Course who used to import golf cars from America. Um quite niche because golf's kind of more seen as exercise in this country than it is in America. Yes. Um, and he he would do this trick of he'd import second-hand golf cars but have them fitted with new batteries. Right. 
so that he didn't pay the import on the new batteries because they were fitted to a golf cart which was second hand. Neat trick. Yeah. Um, but he, he, they obviously did maintenance and he had some batteries which, you know, these are good batteries, I'll let you have these. So again, it was a 96 volt system, but the batteries were very heavy, not very high power. And I actually went up to 100 amp power leisure batteries. Okay. And shed a lot of weight. And the car performed really quite, quite well then. And, you know, what was, sort of range were you getting? Probably 25, 30 miles. Um, you know, my, used to, my drive to work used to be 10 miles. Perfect. And I would put a cable out through the window of the workshop. Once they installed some windows and let some light into my dungeon. <laughs> which took a few years. So that's when the, the days when I actually lived in Harpenden, where I worked. Um, so the commute was even shorter. Uh, it was probably five miles or less. And uh, that was the local run around. And uh, no, I'm getting confused. My memory from these days is so bad. It, I, yeah, I definitely did that one in Luton. I had the imp when I was in Hartenden, but I had the, uh, uh, the kitten uh, once I'd moved to Luton, which was about 25 years ago. And so where did you go from there? Because you've got a few different projects on the go now, I know, um, including a, a sort of remake of a, of a, of a past project. Yeah, um, the, the Sirocco was, was the big one. Um, between 1996 and 1999, I went to America for five weeks each year to help out an electric vehicle race team. So this was a lady called Claire Bell, who at one stage I think think had been the president of the Electric Auto Association uh, or chairman or certainly had been chair of the Bay Area section but I'm, I'm pretty sure she she edited the magazine at one stage again my memory is getting terribly fuzzy um, but having got involved with electric vehicles and I think this was before I got the imp um, there was the electric vehicle discussion list an old-fashioned steam-powered email distribution list which still exists. Um, and I joined in on that because, you know, I was using the internet before there was such a thing as the World Wide Web. Um, I remember when Mosaic came along and was the f one of the very first web browsers, but we were using gophers and email systems uh, yeah. through work. Yeah, well, my my, uh, my dad was a sort of a, introduced me to nerdery, so we were sort of you know, pre downloading games from Prestel for the uh, for the Amstrad in the, in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, I, I had a dial-up modem for my BBC Micro and Acorn Atom. Um, and, yeah, so I, I basically have found out about these electric vehicle races that were happening in America. And I just put out on the discussion list, um, I'd like to come out the races. Is there anybody down there who's got a floor I can sleep on? Because, you know, I, I didn't have a great deal of money, so I was trying to do everything on a, on a shoestring. And Claire responded and basically said, well, you can come and join my race team in California and go down with the car. Um, it had previously been at uh, PIR, Phoenix International Raceway, which is an oval. Um, and this was down at Firebird, which is a, uh, what the Americans call a street circuit. and We just call it a racetrack. Um, or they call it a road course. You know, it actually has corners that go in different directions um and yeah i went and and stayed with claire in a in a trailer home up in the californian mountains amazing and then uh, we drove down to mike's auto care in san mateo uh, my good friend mike slaminski who had a corner family run automotive business but also had one stage been chair of the Bay Area uh, Electric Auto Association. And the, the video link I showed you, sent you of the EV, historic EV racers. Mm. Yeah, Mike's featured in there with his little gotcha. Mark One rabbit. Um, and so we were prepping Claire's Porsche 914, which is also in that, vid that video. 
um, in there and um, with pre-production lead acid batteries things called horizons uh, which would actually hit the dizzying heights of 50 watt hours per kilo <laughs> Um, which were quasi bipolar lead acid with woven plates. Wow, I don't even know what half of that means. Well, I can sort of extrapolate what that means, but yeah. Well, quasi bipolar meant that there was a positive plate and a negative plate. That um, it was um, that it was lead extruded onto fiberglass as thread. So the the grid was then woven. So they'd weave it all in one, leaving one um, warp out to leave a gap and then they paste one negative and the other positive and then you start with a bunch of half plates at one end then you get the the bipolar the quasi bipolar because it's positive and negative stacked up and interleaved all the way down these big long um, modules uh, but the only thing that separated one cell from the next was the wires were coated with wax and that was their major downfall as they got leakage currents yeah. And it wasn't that the leakage currents were terrible, it's just they varied between cells by several hundred percent. So it might be a fraction of a milliamp, but on one it was a fraction of a milliamp and the other one it was two milliamp. And the cells would go out of balance if they weren't in constant use and always being equalised. Um, and Claire was really only using the car for the racing and the cells were, were, were dying every year. And uh, But yet... Yeah, they were expensive because they, you know, they they were pre-production. You know, there was a factory and supposedly they went into full production, making all sorts of bold claims like the water coming out of a factory is cleaner than the water going in, which apparently was actually true. Because um, lead acid traditionally is a fairly dirty process. And, yeah, yeah. Um, they, uh, but yeah, they, I mean, they, they were pretty good and the car was quite competitive um, the two cars you had to beat were um, um, SRP, Salt River Project, which is an Arizona power utility, who had a Ford Probe coupe, because there is a saloon in America, there was a sedan version. Okay. Um, and um, Idaho State University's Z28 uh, Camaro, both running Alan Cocconi's AC propulsion system. So they're running 360 volt systems, we're running 144. Uh, they were using the Optima yellow top sealed lead acids, which we eventually ended up, up using. But you know, their, their drive system was $35,000 for the motor and controller. You know, that's, that's what it went into the, um, the Tesla Roadster um, or a later variant uh, thereof. You know, there's all sorts of anecdotes. Like I, I met Cal Alan Cocconi down there. He drove down there in, a, in his Honda Civic CRX, which had his drive system in, with a Geo Metro, which is a Suzuki Swift engine, yeah, yeah. driving a 25 kVA aircraft alternator in a trailer to turn it into a, um, a hybrid so that he could, he could drive down there. Uh, but but he got he got thrown out of the circuit for doing burnouts in the paddock. There were there was some some from real characters uh, back then. Um, um, I I think I may have actually made, met Jay Struble down there one year just briefly, who was one of the Tesla founders. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and and some other fairly well known names. If you've heard of the White Zombie. Yes, yeah, yeah. Only through watching uh, Johnny Smith's uh, thing about his uh, electric uh, drag strip car. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, John was one of the guys we went racing with. Um, in fact, he was we came. We was part of our team one year, um, and he used to take the zombie down there and, and run it. And Otmar Eben Hoch, who did the the Godzilla motor controller design. Yeah, yeah. And Rich Rudman, I, I knew Rich well. He took over production of the. Um, uh, the Godzilla and uh, Bill Dubay, who with his now wife Eva, uh, build it, doing the electric land speed record motorcycle stuff. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Which I think I've seen on um, uh, on Super Fast Matt's channel. Yeah, gr Green Envy. And um, yeah, so it it was a very interesting time. 
back then I I brought in a, a sort of more balanced approach to the car a lot of people were designing the car from an electrical point of view and I said well yeah that's important but you've also got to look at the mechanics you know you used to be running 50 lap races on an oval we're now running 25 lap races on a uh, a, a, a proper racetrack why are we running low rolling resistance tyres at 60 psi we want to carry the speed through corners not throw it down we'll, we'll get, gain more doing that than we will running low resistance on the straights so you know uh, certainly I had later suspension in the UK do custom suspension units wow. and uh, put an air dam on the car and uh, very and yes, yeah, sticky tyres. We were running um, certainly initially a Yokohama A double O eight Rs, which are basically a road legal slick. Yeah, um, they've got about three grooves in them and some some little round wear indicator holes. Um, and and yeah, I mean they. Um, Certainly, after a few laps and you get them a hot, they were slicks, but they they were street legal, and which was one of the rules. Though I, I don't understand um, sports car club of America racing rules. Uh, these supposedly street legal cars had NASCAR style cages in them, which I didn't think was safe, because basically, if you got hit in the side, there was a door skin, no door, weren't allowed to have a door. You had to have door skin cage. So there was no energy absorption. It was just, oh, this is a very strong cage. Yes, that will just accelerate the driver sideways at 20,000 G and turn them to mush. But that's, yeah, that's the way they they, they, they did things, which caused us some problems because the 914s were so small. Um, and you were supposed to stick within the original gross vehicle weight. And we kind of were, by using the weight from a later 914 when they got heavier. But we actually discovered everybody else was running much heavier cars where well, I know we were just letting them run anyway. So listen, let's, let's bring it right up to now because you've got some fascinating projects on the go. Um, one of which is a sort of a, a restoration of a previous project and then you've got the, you're sat on another uh, one that particularly excites me as, as a Lotus fan. So um, yeah. talk about the Sirocco first of all. Well, the Sirocco, um, I started planning in sort of 98, 99. Um, I bought a motor off Wild Evolutions, Roderick Wild's company, another one of the, the old names from, from uh, the EV world back, back then. It's a big GE motor that was specifically built for electric vehicle conversions. Okay. Um, there were a few little companies in America that had been serially building um, conversions, uh, sometimes from gliders, so engine list cars provided by the manufacturer. Um, I knew it was a good motor. I had a milk float motor that I had reworked because, you know, the specs on a motor, it's an energy conversion device. So you can kind of just pick an operating point and put some numbers on it. That doesn't mean you can't pick another operating point and put some different numbers on it. You know, the motor we were running in the Porsche said 72 volts on it. And exactly the same motor was being sold as a 144 volt motor. And we ended up running 288. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I got this big GE motor that would work. And I knew it would just about fit because there were, there were people with Mark 1 Golfs. And the Sirocco is based on a Mark 1 Golf. Actually a Mark 1 Golf Cabriolet because it's not a Volkswagen. It's a Carmen. Right, okay. They were built at the Carmen factory, and of course the Mark I Golf Cabriolet is also a Carmen, not a Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah. Um, even the paint is different, so the Alpine White is not Volkswagen Alpine White, it's uh, Carmen Alpine White. <laughs> so uh, matching paint was, was, was a bit of an issue. Um, but yeah, it, with what I'd learned, you know, I, I went for a 192 volt system. Um, I got some Optima blue tops, which is actually the marine version of the Optima yellow top deep cycle. Had a pair of extra terminals on it, which came 
handy for the BMS. Um, I got a deal on those through John Wayland, who could get sponsorship from Optima, and in fact got a, got us a set of batteries for the racing one year. Um, and I probably took two or three years to get the car, and I, I dislike a lot of this. This is the first thing, and people haven't done any research, and it not the first time it's been done. Um, but I'm, I'm reasonably confident that was the first road legal EV in the UK capable of over 100 miles an hour. Huh. And it would easily cruise at over 70 miles an hour um, on my 10 mile commute to, uh, to, <laughs> to work. You know, the, the run from junction 11 to junction 10 on the M1 is all uphill. Uh, not steep, but it, it's uphill all the way, and it would easily. Well, I was. But the one time I did think maybe I'll test the top speed, I chickened out at just over 100 miles an hour at approaching junction 10 and, and, and looped, looped back home because um, that was a fairly early run, and the, the lead acid actually need uh, cycling in. Okay. Their capacity actually grows, and if you don't treat them right in the early cycles, you you don't get the capacity. Um, and you know that that was a car that was more or less abandoned. I paid a couple of hundred quid for it, sixty thousand miles, and the engine was wrecked. It's a Volkswagen. It's reliable, but not if you never change the oil. <laughs> and and you're now you're now doing a sort of complete resto on this. Is that right? Yeah, um, after I did Scrappy Challenge in 2005, um, someone contacted me. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think I gave you the link to the... There is a, a copy online. Um, someone contacted the programme uh, trying to get in touch with me, uh, and they ended up buying the Sirocco. Um, and I'd thought over the years, oh, it'd be awfully nice to have that back and update it with modern batteries... Um, and eventually they, the person got in touch and, and said, you know, life circumstances have changed and I need to pass it on. And uh, yeah, I ended up buying it back and it had been standing since 2009. And the sunroof had been leaking. And at one stage there was a couple of inches of water standing in it, which meant all the interior was completely ruined. Um, and although for a mid-1984 Sirocco, it's remarkably solid. There's still a lot of work to do on it. I've just about got to the stage where all the structural rust is um, is all sorted and I'm going to start on the cos cosmetics. Uh, and what are you putting in there? I keep changing my mind about batteries. Um, I want to keep it with its big DC motor and its original motor controller because that's what it was back then. But you wouldn't put lead acid in because that's just expensive and, and doesn't last. Um, so the easiest thing for me to do is originally it would have been about 10 kilowatt hours with a usable capacity of maybe five. Um, but I've got uh, 2020 330 EPAC, which is 12 kilowatt hours. And all six modules will get lost in the front battery box. Yeah. Um, I sort of three by two, would you? So uh, yeah. eighty volts. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to come down in voltage a little bit, but then the lithiums are a little bit stiffer and a little bit uh, flatter discharge, so I probably wouldn't be losing um, anything. I've I've. Got, got eight Tesla modules which I, 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 I got a, a decent price on originally but I miscalculated and I, I think I probably could get them in but it's going to be a struggle and it, it'll end up being my local because I won't be able to do fast charging no, because of the voltage no. um, so you kind of go what's the point in a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack if you can't fast charge absolutely so it'd be better off with, you know, even just even just the twelve, or I I could find a second one and double it up to twenty four, which is still a decent decent yeah. size. Um, but I'm tempted to stick with the twelve, and um, I'll have to change all the springs back to standard ones because there'll be so little weight in it. <laughs> Take so much weight out of it. Well, I mean, it, 
it, it did surprise people because people said, wow, it must be really, really heavy. You know, this is back when I originally did it. I said, it's 1,200 kilos. I had, the, there was a weigh bridge on the farm at Rothenstead and I put it on the weigh bridge, it was 1,200 kilos, which was lighter than the then current model Golf. Yeah, yeah, it's not ridiculous at all. And I'd only lost an inch of depth in the boot as well. I was really quite quite proud of the packaging and actually the best story about the Sirocco. Um, it got taken down to Brooklyn's museum for an alternative energy day. Huh. And um, Trevor Bra- Bayliss breezed in in his E-type and we had a little chat. And I wandered away for a bit, came back to the car to find someone lying down underneath the front. And, you know, had a little chat to me and said, where did you get this? This can't exist. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's not a Volkswagen, it's a Carmen. I said, yeah. He said, but it's a city stromer, isn't it? I said, no, 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 I built it. See, right from the Mark I Golf at the Wolfsburg plant, they hand-built electric golfs. Huh. They were called city stromers. Uh, Johnny Smith did a little piece on them. Um... And they were maybe built a couple of hundred, and I think they mostly sold them to staff who worked at Wolfsburg, so they could kind of get real-world data about what it was like to live with an electric car. Sure. With someone who wasn't getting a short-term loan, it was their car. Uh, and I, I know they did Mark 1s and Mark 2s, and I'm pretty sure they did Mark 5s. But he's like, well, this is a home build. He said, yeah, he said, better than the Mark 1 City Strummer in build quality. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, you know, I, I put a lot of effort into making it not look like a travelling science project, as the Americans was put it, which which described a lot of the vehicles that you'd see through the Battery Vehicle Society. Yeah, I think, I think that would be a fair description of mine at the moment. I'm trying to change that, but it's a bit of a work in progress. <laughs> but you haven't got exposed batteries and exposed terminals and <laughs> no, your batteries are at least in battery boxes and all, all covered up. Yeah. I mean, I actually had special uh, polycarbonate show battery lids. So people could look through. Yeah, because because you you know they'd want to see the batteries, and a, and a, a, a neat grey box didn't do it for them. And I had lots, and of course I had lots of blinky lights because lead acid needs a lot of looking after. So I had little. Uh, battery balance boards with the little LEDs would, would blink as it, it uh, was balancing them. Well, people like blinky LEDs as well. So listen, we, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but I do want to talk to you about the Lotus before we do. Um, what's the what's the state of play with that project? Because that's kind of what's next for you, isn't it? I was actually working on the Excel this morning. Okay. Um, fighting with bolts that don't want to come out. Um Ever since I went racing in the 90s, I wanted to do an electric Lotus Esprit. You mean and, <laughs> Well, Esprits seem to have gone out of the price range. Um, I missed out on a quite a nice Series 3 for 13000 Because I had like three days to do the deal um, and somebody else could do it faster. Um, I then tried to well, I then thought, hang on, what about the Excel? What about the Forgotten Lotus, which was actually a, one of Lotus's best sellers. Yeah, yeah. But they, o- but they only actually made a couple of thousand between 1982 and 1992. Um, and I had a word with a friend of mine who has many, many Lotuses, um, including, a, I think he's got Lotus 6 chassis number one. Not the first Lotus 6, but the first production Lotus 6. And at one stage, he had one of the prototype sprays. And yeah, he said, yeah, that, that sounds like a, uh, a good thing. So you can still buy a drivable Excel for about £4,000. And I paid a bit less than that for one that it turned out had been sitting in a front garden um, in Yorkshire for since 2006. Now, they are galvanised chassis. Um, and of course the body's fiberglass yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've actually got some serious rust issues on ancillary 
stuff and in particular I, I can't get a bottom um, wishbone bolt out at the moment it's just started to move a tiny bit uh, but you know they, they're light I've actually just weighed it at 1080 kilos wow which for a big car and they are quite big cars it yeah, is, yeah. is quite light um, apparently they were quicker around the Hethel test track than the non-turbo spree they're better balanced yeah um, not as quick in a straight line but, but, sure. but quicker around the track and of course, two plus two. It's unfair to say they're a four seater. There, there are yes. there are two plus two. They're a bit short on headroom in the back. Um, so the current plan is to use a leaf motor, right? Which will be an early leaf motor, the one they used up to two thousand thirteen, the EM sixty one as it, it it's designated, which has got stronger magnets and more torque. Yes. Um, I think they then just decided they could get the same power and efficiency from a cheaper motor well they, they underpower them anyway don't they? they sort of they, uh, they oh yeah well they the current model golf 62 plus or 63 plus is 217 ps and that's the em57 motor that was used from 2013 onwards um they they limited it because of the batteries um uh, they limited it on what 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 they want to to do as a peak draw from the battery and as the pack sizes went up, they could then ramp up the, the performance. So I've actually leaf, got a... Leaf motor. Leaf motor. The engineering solution um, is to take the first reduction stage out of the leaf gearbox, put it in a custom housing, and then drive the prop shaft. Wow, okay. Direct kind of like the... Yes, yeah, so kind of like they're doing with the reduction drive box on the back of the um, the Hyper 9. Gotcha, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that I can then get the motor where the gearbox is. Um, and the gearing will be about right for 90 miles an hour, which is all you can realistically use in this country. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I've got um, 44 and a half kilowatt hours of 2020 MGZS modules. Very cool. Which, that's 220 kilos. Okay. So They're a heavy car. No, I'm, I'm hoping that I can keep the weight increase down to no more than 100 kilos. Wow. Um, the, the, the Lotus engine is light you know it's not it was pretty cutting edge in the 70s by the 80s it was getting a little bit uh, well I, I think the problem is everybody was expecting a six cylinder or an eight cylinder in that kind of car um, and Lotus originally made the decision because it was a fuel crisis times mm, of course. to do the two litre which was 160 horsepower uh, later 180 um, but always planned to do a 4 litre V8 version but they only built like a couple of engines They and it was years before they ever put the, the, the V8 in the Esprit so that's where I'm going with, with, with the, um, the, the Excel um, and then it turns out I've also bought an Esprit <laughs> How have you bought an Esprit? Um, it popped up on eBay. Uh, that there is a little sad tale in between of me trying to buy an Esprit from someone who didn't own it. Right. They had an option to buy it, but couldn't even afford to pay the deposit, and they were going to use my money to buy it and sell it to me. Right. But without actually being in any way honest about the the situation. Um, so I thought, well, that that's it. That that, that I'm not going to get an Esprit. And then quite a well-known Esprit popped up on eBay. Um, it was built by a guy called Dean Messon, and it's on air ride suspension, so that it can be dropped to a couple of inches off the ground when parked. You know, one of the slammed cars. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it also has a Alpha Busso 24 valve V6 in the back. So it's not exactly original. <laughs> it's not exactly original. So uh, I'm, I'm, 
if I do convert that, it, it, it's going to be a while away. But uh, uh, yes, it's it's not going to annoy the purists no. um, so much. Not that they seem to be that that worried anyway. But it's going back onto standard suspension just because the air ride system leaks air like a sieve, so it takes about twenty minutes to drop to the deck. <laughs> Um, and uh, I kind of want a running Esprit for a while, so the engine will stay in for a... I mean, who wouldn't want a running Esprit, especially one with a boost though, isn't it? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's on individual throttle bodies as well. Um, so it's probably about 240 horsepower. Oh, that's going to sound glorious. Yeah, I think one of the issues with it is it's actually going to be too loud to drive any distance and I'm, I'm going to have to do some work on it to actually uh, uh, quiet it down and because it was obviously more of a show car than a go car I think the most it was ever driven in a year was 800 miles <laughs> I think the doors um, the hinges the bushes had gone when Dean bought it a decade ago so you have to lift the doors to close them so and and it was halfway through being re re retrimmed, uh, but yes, uh, for for twelve thousand pounds, I took a deep breath and breath and clicked by it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to you. That sounds like a fantastic future project, and that's probably a good point at which to wrap it up. Just sheer jealousy on my part. <laughs> that sounds phenomenal. Um, if I'm ever well, in way, I'm gonna I'm gonna beg for a ride in that, whether it's converted or not. Uh, yes, at the moment it has no interior in it. I've got got things to, to to sort out. But yes, I'm afraid I would also make you jealous with my facilities as well. Well, that too. Yes. Uh, although I do, I know I don't want to jinx it, but I do might have a lead on a garage just around the corner. So, uh, well, I have a full machine shop. Yeah, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Paul. It has been fascinating. Hey, okay, you're more than welcome. So many stories there. And uh, yeah, I'll post all of those those links and photos in the show notes as well, and I'll probably put them up on my blog as well uh, at projects.tc. Oh, I should I should probably do the do the the t-shirt you see. Yeah, yeah, show me, show me. Women's Electric Racing Education International Team, fantastic. Yeah, that that was uh, Claire's team when it was all women, and uh, I I was an honorary member without surgery. <laughs> Well, maybe we can resurrect it in the UK if one of my girls decides to race one of the cars at some point. Um, I've got a picture of a single-seater electric racing car that was all girls' high school built. Very. A uh, team from Nova Scotia. You know, it's uh... super cool. Brill. Listen, right. I should wrap it up there. Um, if you did enjoy this, please do like and subscribe. And um, you can also find the audio version on all your usual podcast platforms on Spotify and on Apple, uh, Apple iTunes and on Google and on Stitcher and all of those. Um, or keep watching the videos and do subscribe to the YouTube channel for all sorts of EV and in the future other project related content. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye all. <laughs>